I'm Joe. I, I, and I mean, my actual given name is Eyal, but my close friends call me Joe. So Vicky is not officially, she's been demoted now. No, just kidding. Um, and I'm, I was thinking about this today and I'm like, I think I'm a recovered Christian. Is that an interesting term? But uh, anyways, uh, I'm getting used to it uh, because it tends to be, I think, often when we uh, look at our Christianity, it's, there is the, you know, the tradition or the, the of what it means to be culturally Christian. Uh, and then there's the, the faith component of it, which is the relationship that we actually have with the living God. Uh, which are profoundly different. And I think at times I've conflated those two uh, relationships and found myself in kind of a, a codependent relationship with God. And in addition to that, also uh, naturally in a codependent relationship with people. And so many horrible things come out of that. And so I, I feel like I'm recovering um, the original intent of my faith. Uh, a relationship that is fueled by grace and fueled by the love of God, uh, his unmerited, undeserved favor. And so the title of today's talk was You're Not Good Enough. And the reason why I decided to kind of land on that title was I've been having these really interesting conversations with people on social media. And just through the work that I do, I tend to uh, connect with all sorts of really interesting people with different belief systems and ideas. And and there's this one uh, individual that um, I've done work with, and she's part of what was part of this amazing uh, company that she worked for, very successful. And uh, a couple of years ago, had a massive burnout uh, to the point where she was so uh, done that she was basically wheelchair bound, uh, couldn't function and is it's still in recovery, interestingly enough. And uh, so we've been talking and she's been asking for advice just based on what I've gone through. And so she's been asking me some really interesting questions. And one of it is this idea of, and I think well, most of us have experienced this, but a persistent and continued loss in a specific area. Um, that she's just simply given up on. Um, and, and I'll try to, you know, make it as general as possible, but I think all of us here have an area in our lives that we've simply given up on, like we've lost hope. Uh, for some, it could be your weight. It could be relationships. Uh, for some, it can even be just the inability to contain their rage, you know, or fragile self-image, it could even be like a business that you've been trying to make work, but for whatever reason, it's not working. It could be obviously your finances. That's a big one. Our all sorts of addictions that all of us here are working through. Um, and what I, I guess, want to communicate is, is that often, no matter what we do in those areas, you just keep coming back kind of to the same place, you know, year after year. It's like, here's another year and you just keep losing. And, uh, and so she was really communicating to me in this context of saying, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. Like I, I can't do this anymore. Um, I can't take any more losses. And it's become so persistent, it's actually unbearable. And so she was asking a question that I think all of us will ask at some point, which is it's like, maybe there's something that I'm missing. I just got to work harder. You know, I got to do more. Um, especially, and this is the hard part, and this is the, the paradox of the situation is, is that generally, if you're struggling in a very specific area, whatever it is, name it, you're probably putting a lot of effort, you know, a lot of time to fix the issue. But you can't seem to move this boulder. Um, so kind of year after year, you're just trying to get past this. You know, sometimes you're trying to climb the wall. Sometimes you're trying to 
punch <laughs> through the wall. Sometimes you're trying to go around the wall, but often you come to the same place. So I didn't know how to answer this question was to her. And so I, I kind of prayed to God and, and I felt like I had a, an insight and a revelation just based on my own struggles. And so I'm going to read a, a passage that really spoke to me and, and I used kind of to help her. And it's um, actually, it's a story of David and uh, it, it's really interesting because it's, you know, it's one of these stories where I think most of us have heard or maybe haven't, if you're not a person who reads this Bible, but I'll, I'll just read the story for you guys just so that you can understand it. But uh, here it goes. It says, now the king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jezebites who inhabited the land. So here he is marching to fight these guys. They're, these guys are kind of the arch enemies of Israel. Uh, the Jezebites said to David, and this is the statement, you will never get in here. Even the blind and lame can repel you. And then it says, for they thought David could not get in here. And then it says this really fascinating. It says, nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. That is the city of David. So, I, I, you know, you don't know maybe the story of David, but here's this guy named David that he finds himself in this circumstance, which is like, he's just not good enough. In this one area of his life, he's just not good enough. He's tried over and over again, and he's failed. So year after year, he's gone to take possession of this land only to suffer one defeat after the, another. And, and it's interesting because it says here, it got so bad for David that the Jezebites, the enemy, would laugh at his continued efforts to overtake them. So they, they basically no longer have taken him seriously. They're like, oh, <laughs> here he comes. Literally, that's what they're doing. Because they were shouting, even the blind, the blind and lame can repel you. It's like, this is like, we don't even have to worry about you. Like, you, 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 and, and I think this is the challenge is, is that David, remember, this is the David that killed Goliath with a slingshot. He's the guy who is the, you know, the king of, at the time, I guess you would say, one of the most powerful. He had taken one place after the other easily. So for David, I'm sure it had become such a massive barrier uh, that it literally, the writer describes it as a fortress. Like, and I don't know if you know what a fortress is, but it's like, it's a military term, but it's basically, it, you can't penetrate this thing. It's an impossibility kind of thing. And I think for most of us, if we're honest enough, that's usually how the places, and this is the revelation that I had, that I felt I wanted to, it, it, in the places where we think we're not good enough, the places where we have failed over and over again, I find that's usually the places where we're supposed to rule over. But literally, they're just presented to us as these old, difficult, discouraging challenges. And, and I say this mostly from my own personal experience, is that if I look back in the areas where I've had the greatest amount of challenges, I've also had the greatest amount of insight because I understand better than anyone else what it feels like to be, you know, discouraged. <laughs> and so how do you, you know, why, first of all, why are we presented with these challenges in life where we feel like we're not good enough? What's the purpose behind them? So in, in the biblical story, there's an interesting component in the sense that there's a point where the Israelites are actually given these Ten Commandments, you know, they come out of Egypt and uh, there's a moment where they basically are like, hey, you know, God, <laughs> yeah, we need some direction kind of thing. And Moses goes up the mountain, 
and he comes down with these Ten Commandments. And basically, God gave them these Ten Commandments. So this is going to be how they were going to relate to God. And interesting enough, the very day that the Ten Commandments were given, they broke them. Like the first, the, 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 before he even the, the commandment had come down, they had built a calf, a golden calf with the gold that they had gained from Egypt, and they turned it into an idol and they started worshiping it. And and Moses comes down the mountain and he's like, he he's like Aaron, which is his brother at the time, like he left him in charge. He's <laughs> like, what happened? And what it was, was is that they had broken the first commandment, which was that shall not have no other God beside me. Because what it was is that the law was given to show the people of Israel that they weren't moral enough, that they weren't good enough. It was a mirror to basically show them that a effort they put in and as you know the, the the jewish people they had over 613 commandments that they have to follow no matter how righteous they thought how good they were they were just never good enough and most of the stories that we see in the um when jesus you know in the in the, in, the, in the um in the gospels is jesus basically revealing to people how impossible it is to please god <laughs> with us rule keeping and all that stuff so that must have been like a, a really discouraging thing for the Israelites every day to know that they're just not good enough. And in our, in our world, I find like, and this is a lot of the new age movement that kind of puts out this message that says, no, 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 you're good. You're good enough. You just have to try a little harder. You know, the new age movement is often rooted in Eastern mysticism and elevates the individual into a godlike status. So it inflates the sense of ourself, while Christianity tells us we're fallen individuals in need of a savior, meaning Christianity introduces the whole story is we're not good enough. Like the, the word sin actually means to miss the mark. Like literally what it is, is, is that we'll never able to hit, as long as we're on this side of heaven, we'll always miss the mark to some extent. Christ is the one that fulfills it on our behalf, which is kind of profound, which is so cool. So modern spirituality believes we're intrinsically good and are the center of the universe. And if we do enough work, we can extract the good about ourselves. So how many of us have tried that, like to extract the good about ourselves? Like, I'm just good enough. You know, if I just say enough mantras, if I ever, that eventually, but the old difficult, discouraging challenges that we're faced with, they're still there. And so scripture tells us that, interesting enough, it goes deeper. It says there's nothing good in us it even goes further by stating that the heart is deceit, deceitful and desperately wicked. And now, what a crazy definition. By the way, that word deceit, uh, deceitful means crooked, polluted, or slippery. That's the heart of man. We simply cannot be trusted. But even more tragic, this situation is terminal. It's incurable, basically. So the issue that we try to fix on our own, and this is why the big book is so powerful. If there was one thing that I really extracted from the big book, and I didn't understand it before, you know, the conception and the idea, and you hear this, Jordan Peterson recently was being interviewed, and, and they asked him, they said, what is the, you know, the, the, the way that some, it was, he was talking specifically with porn addiction, but he said, in all addictions, we know for certain the only way somebody can overcome an addiction is through a supernatural power, a higher power. And, 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 and that is really the crux and I think the deep revelation of the big book is the fact that we're not good enough. It literally tells us from the outset that we have to surrender to this idea or to this illusion that we of our own selves, apart from God, 
can overcome this debilitating thing that we are dealing with. And so what I want you to, I guess, get from this little talk, and it's this talk to myself, is to relieve you of the pressure of having to be good enough. That there's something beautiful about God is that he takes the ugly things, the very things that we can't deal with and we don't know what to do. And when we give it to him, he transmutes it, he changes it. And this is what the story of David is, is that this challenge, this fortress has been building up his faith and his strength this whole time. That it was actually designed to bring him to his knees. To get, kill every ounce of ego that says, I'm good enough. You know, the, the, all of us have that part that says, I can do it alone. I don't need anyone. I'm God. That's basically what we're saying. And I think that's the, the lie of our, of, of our modern world, is this idea that we can force our way through these challenges. But I know for sure, I know the challenges that I've been confronted with and people that I'm really close with right now, and they are literally overcome with this challenge and and it's and, and the beautiful part of it though is is that that ultimately this distress is designed to lead us to the lord to finally surrender so whatever it is that you're dealing with today and this is the thing it's a daily act by the way it's not something that because we forget we wake up next morning and we're like oh this, i gotta give it back to god again so here's the thing I'm learning is it's the mindset or attitude that needs to change before we can finally rule over our pain. Meaning it's not the thing, the fortress that has to move. It's our vantage point, our perspective that has to first change. And I believe that's probably the most difficult thing for all of us to deal with because for us, we're transactional. No, 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 you don't, like, God, like, I'll do this if you do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And, but God wants our hearts. And he's asking us, are you willing to really, truly believe me? Even when you don't see a kernel of hope? You know, the story of uh, Abraham is that. It's a story of a guy who has this promise that he's going to be a father of many nations and he can't have a baby. And he finds himself at age 85. Basically, it, it, it's like, it's hopeless. But it, it reads really interesting when you read it in Romans 4. It talks about how Abraham, like though he knew that his wife was basically, as you know, it, it said her womb was old. <laughs> basically, he saw the reality for what it was. He's like, okay, my wife is incapable of bearing a child. But it said, really weird, it said he had hope in hope. He was in a hopeless situation, yet he still had hope. I explained that to me. What it said to me was, ew, hope is not based on this pie in the sky concept. This is not the hope he's speaking of. He's speaking of a hope that's supernatural. So what, what we I'm learning is, is that I can't grit and force my way into freedom. What I have to do, and this is what I've watched in the areas that I've struggled is, is that we get to watch these fortresses turn into the footstills as we stand under the canopy of God's grace. That through just us surrendering on a day-to-day -day basis, one day they literally, this fortress becomes our footstool. What we're in, guys, all of us, is a spiritual battle that can only be won in the, in the spiritual realm. And we have to, in essence, because it is a spiritual battle, it's the thoughts 
that tell us, oh no, this is permanent. This is never going to change. But we have to hold those, the Bible says, to the obedience of Christ. Every thought, hold every thought captive. It's asking for help and exposing our weakness to God that we find freedom. Because I know a whole lot of us, we have so much pride and ego that we can't let anybody in, in that area of our greatest struggle because there's so much shame attached to it. But the Bible says to us to bring our weaknesses into the open. That's literally what it says. It says literally that we are to confess our sins to one another. And in this group is really that. It's confessional in some ways because we're just bringing who we are. I believe it's the only way out. Here's the interesting thing about this story of David, though. And this is the, the, the thing that really was profound. Interestingly enough, this fortress is the same place that David experienced, like the, the, that David continued to experience persistent loss. It became known as the city of David, or what we call modern day Israel. Isn't that crazy? Here's the takeaway. This is what I really got from this. The very area that looks like old, difficult, discouraging challenge is the very place you're meant to rule. It's the very place I'm meant to rule. And that to me is so freeing because it empowers me. If that means then God has given me something, which is he's given me the grace to endure. You know, the, the Bible talks often about that, those that endure to the end. And this race that we have in this life, it's not easy. We all have challenges. We all have skeletons. We all have, you know, a limp of some sort. But those are the places where we wrestle with God. Throughout scripture, you see that these incredible stories, you know, where Jacob wrestles with the angel of the Lord. It's this place called Bethel. But that's the place that God literally gives him his new name. And he calls him Israel, which is the prince of God. He goes from being Jacob, which is the deceiver, <laughs> supplanter, to prince of God, Israel. And that is the hope that I have, is that the reason why I continue to now move forward and expose myself and to be in an environment where I can talk about my struggles is because I know that God is doing something that I don't realize, that I don't even see.